The 25th Hour Radio Show. Missy, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing a few minutes out of your life with me. It's definitely a pleasure uh, having you as a guest today on the 25th Hour Radio Show. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to glad to be on. Missy, if it wasn't for me already knowing the type of person you are uh, through listening to other interviews, watching other television shows, etc., I don't know if I could have asked you uh, to answer this first question I'm about to ask, but, but since I do know your story and basically how you've flipped the script, so to say, by turning a negative into a positive, do you mind sharing with my listeners what exactly happened that day in December of 1997 at Heath High School in Paducah, Kentucky? Sure. Um, I was um, 15 years old at the time, and it was on December the 1st, 1997. And me and my twin sister um, had been attending a prayer circle our sophomore year. And um, we uh, went to prayer circle just like we did every single morning. Um, and that particular morning, as we got to the prayer circle, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I remember, um, you know, everybody sort of walking around and talking to each other just like we normally did. And then someone yelled, time to pray. And then we all got into the circle, about 30 or 40 of us, and then we prayed, and we said amen, and I was on my way to get my backpack uh, to go to my very first class for the morning, and that's when a fortunate old boy pulled a 22 out of his backpack, and he started shooting at us, and at the time, I didn't see him with the gun. The very first thing that I did see was a girl get shot in the head, mm. and she fell to the ground. And as I saw this, I, I, I couldn't make sense of it because, you know, first of all, it was the shooting that happened at our school was before, you know, one of the big ones, such as Columbine. I mean, this was um, something very surprising to us to happen in our school. So as I stood there and I stared at her, I kept just kind of waiting for her to get up. And then even hearing the gunshots, I kept thinking to myself, like, you know, that because I was not familiar to, to guns whatsoever at the time. And it sounded like firecrackers to me, so I thought that was part of the joke. And as I was just standing there trying to figure out everything, I remember hearing three slow pops, and then there was a spray of bullets, and I was hitting spray. And when I was hit, I didn't even feel the bullet hit me. It was more like, um, I guess I could describe it kind of like fainting, because my entire body went numb, uh, even my hearing left. And I felt like, um, even I guess like even hitting, I guess I felt like I was floating when I fell and then hitting the ground, the impact didn't even hurt. And then once I, um, landed on the ground, my twin sister, um, who pretty much knew exactly what was happening because she did see him with the gun and she did also feel a bullet go through her hair and actually rubbed the back of her neck. And thank goodness she didn't have any kind of injury, but, um, she crawled over to me and hovered over me while he was still shooting. And then when he finally stopped, um, that's when I started trying to ask her questions. And I know that she, you know, she had a hard time answering me because of being in shock as well. And, and then she finally answered me and told me that there was a gun. And then she told me who did it. And that's when I realized I'd been shot. But I'd also, I couldn't believe that she was telling me that this person did what he did because he was the last person that I would have picked to, to say that he would be capable of something like this. And so, um, after realizing I'd been shot, um, I had a black shirt on and so we couldn't really find where I was injured. And so the very first thing I noticed is that I couldn't feel my stomach. And so both me and my sister didn't know what that meant, but, you know, I felt fine at the time. And, and for some reason I didn't even really notice my legs for some reason. I don't know why, I guess it was just the shock of everything. Mm -hmm. And then we saw, um, another friend of ours who had been grazed by a bullet on her left shoulder. So my twin sister told me to be strong and she said, don't die. I'll be back to check on you. And so after she checked on her friend, um, she started becoming very overwhelmed. So, you know, I told her if she needed to leave the lobby, that she could, and she actually did, even though she felt bad for it, but she was able to actually call uh, my parents and let them know what was going on before anyone could contact, contact them and tell them that there was something that even happened at the school, so that was kind of a good thing that she was able to do that and kind of give them some comfort that I was still talking when she left me, mm -hmm. and so while that was happening with her, um, my algebra teacher had came over to me, and she knelt down beside me. And she began to pray, 
and that's when I started to really kind of get scared and and I looked at her and I and I asked her if I was going to die and she said no you're not going to die you're going to be fine and then I told her well I, I can't feel anything I can't feel my stomach I can't move my legs I, I know I'm paralyzed and she said no you're not paralyzed you're just in shock you're going to be fine but um I think that she knew exactly what was happening to me and and I pretty much did, too. She was just trying to make sure that I didn't go into shock. And so um, after my teacher had prayed for me, I then started to get very tired. And I'm pretty sure it was probably just loss of blood, and I wanted to close my eyes. And she kept telling me to keep my eyes open, and then I ended up closing them. And then I was out for some time. I don't even remember how long, or, you know, I'd, I had no idea of how long. But when I woke up, I looked over to my right. And there was a girl um, that I didn't notice before, but I remember seeing my chemistry teacher holding her. And um, my algebra teacher was that was with me before. I remember hearing her say over and over and over again, she's not going to make it. She's not going to make it. Mm. And um, I basically watched this girl roll all over the ground and moan until the ambulances came to get her. You know that, and after that, that was, that was basically it. You know, and I do want to mention, out of respect for the other victims and families of those victims of the Heath High School shooting, I am just going to concentrate on your story, Missy. And, and, and Missy, how, how did you learn and what emotions were going through your head, you know, when you, when you found out that you never would walk again, I mean, without assistance? Well, um, I actually kind of mostly found out, I guess, I guess my first, um, uh, I, I recollection of like a doctor actually telling me was whenever I got to the emergency room and they started performing tests on me and um, poking me with a needle and asking me to move my feet. And once I uh, couldn't do those things or couldn't feel the pokes, that's when they had told me that I was paralyzed. But it was really odd because when they told me this, like I had this sense of like, you know, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Don't worry. And so I wasn't scared and I wasn't upset and I thought I was crazy for that, for feeling that way. Mm -hmm. And so I started to like even try to make myself cry because, you know, I thought this is crazy. You know, you've been told you're paralyzed. This is a bad thing. And so I tried to make myself cry and then I felt like I was not fooling anybody. I mean, I really was trying and it was, it just, you know, I, I felt like I was faking it. So then I, you know, I stopped. But I think that from the time that I had passed out, you know, and I was so concerned about whether I was going to die, when my teacher was praying for me, I really think God was there comforting me and telling me that I was going to be okay. And then whenever, whenever I was told that I was paralyzed, I, it was one of those things where, you know, I felt like God was like, you know what, you're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. And this is, you know, I almost felt like I was being told that this is going to be used for something. And yeah. now, you're Missy, going to be fine. Yeah, you know, Missy, I, I know you've said you, you had forgiven the shooter and accepted yes. the situation immediately you, you know i mean is that true i did i immediately um forgave him for, for what he did to me um i just felt like um the anger that that i would have in my heart because of of not forgiving i i just knew that it wasn't going to be good for me it wouldn't change what happened you know it, it was i was blessed to still be alive i was getting a second chance out of life, and I didn't want my second chance to be, you know, angry and mad. I just wanted to, to forgive so that I could move on. It wasn't anything to set him free, because I think people are afraid that you want them to forgive. They, they're afraid of letting that person off, but, I mean, I definitely felt like I let myself off, that I didn't let that day continue to control me, and you still have to deal with the consequences of his actions, because he still killed three girls, and he injured five people, and changed the community and surrounding community, so... You know, forgiveness was just a way for me to get another chapter of trying to move on with my life and, and be happy and thankful for, for what I had. Now, was there ever... And I don't think if I, if I didn't do that, if I didn't do that forgiveness, I really don't think that I would be the person I am today or have what I have, such as, you know, a wonderful husband and yeah. two children that are, you know, that are wonderful and, you know, in a job I love. I mean, I'm, I, I'm very happy. Now, was there ever a moment, you know, during, especially during the, the, the long months ahead, uh, during your rehabilitation, uh -huh. where you where you had a relapse of thinking, maybe, on how you felt about the shooter in your situation, where maybe faith played a big role in bringing you back to the place you needed to be? 
I think it was more of not towards him, but towards just the situation of how hard it was during some of the rehabilitation. Um, after um, getting over the injury to my lung, because uh, I played flat for so long, they then started to sit me up so that I could start using the wheelchair. And, and so I laid flat in an event for a very long time, and, and sitting up was extremely difficult, even though I never thought it would be like that. I guess it was blood pressure or something, but I felt constantly sick. And I really was to the point where I was like, I'm just going to stay in this bed. It's too hard. But... I really felt like God brought me um, so many people all over the world writing letters to me and telling me they were praying for me. They knew I could do it. I received, like, every day for months, or, and the most, I received 600 letters and 45 packages in one day. And I would have garbage bags of mail in my room. My mom would sit in my bed and, and read those letters to me, and, and they were so encouraging. And I thought, you know, these people need to know me, even people from other countries who uh, could barely speak English, but just enough to tell me they were praying. For me, and I just thought if these people took the time out to do this, why can't I take the time out to, to you know, bring myself back to independence in my life? Um, yeah, you, we're, we're kind of on the same level here because I was going to ask you about those letters next and, and how influential right. those letters were in, the re, in your recovery process. They were. I mean, I, I still have them today, I, I, you know, or most of them. It was just um, what I could say, but it was just... Uh, encouraging and it was just like an overwhelming um, feeling of, of knowing that you know there's so much bad in the world you think because you watch so much bad on TV but I felt like seeing these letters from all these people showed me how much good there was in the world and that was that was you know almost like a refreshing like moment after such a tragedy that had happened at my school to know that there was still good out there you know and to not take away from the people who took the time to send the letters and gifts uh, to you but as time passes, you know, I believe the only shoulders we really have to cry on is that of God, family, and, and close mm-hmm. friends. And speaking of family, how did you meet your husband, Josh? Well, um, in college, we, we met. Um, we were both at, you know, in a uh, fraternity and a sorority. And so through that, we met each other. And um, once we met each other, we went on our first date, which was actually just a movie at my apartment because we were, um, you know, because we didn't have money. <laughs> being college students. Of course. And yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that was our first date. And, um, every day after that we had, we sit together until, you know, he asked me to marry him, um, on Christmas Eve, which was also my birthday, um, right after we graduated from college. And then it just kind of about a year and a half later on June 24th of 06, we got married. So I'm going to put Josh on point here because that's what guys do to each other. Um, right. <laughs> how, did, how, how did Josh propose to you? Well, we had just gotten home uh, to my apartment um, after uh, spending some time uh, for Christmas Eve at my parents' house, and we went to my um, one bedroom um, apartment, and uh, he was dropping me off, and we came. He came inside, and I went to my bedroom for a minute. And he actually had a friend that lived about a couple doors down from, from me, and he ran to his friend's house to try to get our song, which was Amazed by Lone Star. Um, and that was, you know, just our, our song that we kind of felt like it was best, you know. And so he couldn't find it, so he just kind of come up with some other song that he could that he could use because this was kind of back before, you know, we could, like, use our iPhone and Oh, yeah, of it. Course. yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> right. So he, so he got that song. He, he lit some candles, and then when I when I came out of my bedroom, there he was waiting for me, and I and and then he proposed to me, and it was it was very sweet, and and um and I was excited, and of course I said yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and this proposal has given you two wonderful children, right? Two boys. It has, yes, two boys. Um, my oldest is eight, and his name is Logan, and my youngest is Carter, and he is five. Now, was it difficult to raise uh, the children being in the situation that you were in, being in the wheelchair? Well, it just took some time. Like, as they were infants, it was just a little, uh, the difficulty was just kind of learning how to, you know, manage everything. But I, I, I found ways of of figuring it out and, and doing it. I a think mother will find a way, right? <laughs> exactly. And I have to say my biggest challenge was when they became mobile and they started walking and just making sure that they didn't get away from me if we were outside or something like that. That was my biggest challenge. But um, whenever um, 
Logan got older, and then, you know, when I had Carter, he was there to kind of help me out. So whenever it was just Logan, it was a little bit more difficult. So, um, so, so you know, it, it, there's going to be discipline. And now it's a bit difficult because my son, Logan, eight years old, and when it comes to discipline and stuff like that. I know exactly what you mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, when did you decide that you wanted to become a motivational speaker slash author and to tell your story to well, the world? It was actually um, my junior year in high school. I was um, I'd been asked. Uh, well, there was a, a bunch of the of victims and um, different people had been asked to uh, come speak at a school in Illinois, actually um, Massac Middle School. And um, I was asked to go with the group, and I was kind of a little nervous about it because I'd always seen myself as you know shy and. I wasn't sure how I would do getting up and speaking. And so I did it, and I actually did pretty good. And so after that confidence of it, you know, it, it, I just had, like, a couple different people from there kind of trickle down and ask me to uh, to do it. And then finally I made the decision to do it full-time. And once I did it full-time, you know, well, actually, I mean, just kind of doing more and more, and that's just kind of how it happened. And then once I realized that I could actually do it and with years of, of kind of uh, kind of doing it over and over again, I just got better and better until, you know, I, I started like hearing, you know, just the the response from the different people that um, that heard me speak, and I really felt like I was making a difference, and I really felt like I was um, putting something positive into this whole negative situation, and I started thinking, you know, I can make a difference with this. I can use the fact that I'm in a wheelchair and a good visual of violence as a way to, to show people that, you know, what can happen. And and even though that I've been able to handle it in a good way, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it can be prevented in some way if we are, are, are proactive and not so reactive like my school was. But, you know, now, you know, then we weren't, it, we didn't think something like that could happen in the school. But now we realize that sort of thing can happen anywhere, which is very scary. And um, I just, I felt I had this overwhelming feeling of, you know, that's just one of the things that God wanted me to do is to use this, it, especially since I can just get up and talk, and it just comes out of my mouth. Now, what and kind, it's been the response. What kind of it's response wonderful. do you get? Yeah, I was going to say, what kind of response do you get after one of your speeches at a high school? I mean, do students well, ever come up to you? Do they be, confide things in you? Oh, yeah, def- definitely. I have I have students that come up and talk to me about being bullied and, and how to handle it and how they feel much more confident to to deal with the situation i still i have um you know people that even have had family members or they went through tragic events where they've had to, to overcome um something that was a big deal you know such as you know um being in a wheelchair or having some some type of uh, disability that they had to overcome or a family member did um you know even as far as like forgiveness and and having a hard time forgiving and feeling like they had the power to do that. And I've even had some kids that have contemplated suicide and, and had said that, you know, but, you know, because of bullying and different things that they, that they feel like they can, they can um, get past it and, and, and do, you know, and live their life. And, and so for me, I feel like it's just, it, and then also I get emails all the time or, or different people that just heard me speak. And so, and, and people telling me to keep spreading my message. So I just feel like, you know, God's using me in a, in a huge way, and, and I'm very blessed to, to have been, you know, 15 years old and find the purpose in my life. Uh, there's some people that are 80 and don't know their purpose, so mm-hmm. I'm I'm blessed for that, and, and if this is what God wants me to do, then I'm I'm willing to do it, because he, he's just working through me. I can tell when I get up and speak. It just really just comes out of my mouth, and and now, whatever is on my heart, it, it just comes out. Now, is this something that you think you will do for the rest of your life? Um, I think I will. I think it's something that I'll do as long as people keep asking me to come. And then my husband also does an awesome job of finding different places or organizations and letting them know what I do. And so, yes, I think this is something that I will continue until um, I'm unable to. So, You know, I have one last question for you, Missy. And, and if you don't want yeah. to answer this, I completely understand but I am compelled to ask, you met with mm-hmm. Michael Carneal in prison. Yes. You confronted the yes. person who put you in a wheelchair, who took the lives of others at Heath High School. What was the dialogue like between you two that day? Um, well, we did talk for two and a half hours. Um, from, it, it was such a long time that I cannot 
give you exact, but I can kind of give you a gist of some of the things we did talk about. Um, one one of the things that is that I shared what I remembered that morning because I wanted you know in detail. So I wanted him to know what I saw, you know, from that day, and then I wanted to know what he remembered, which he had a hard time um, kind of giving me that because he kind of said that he didn't know if what he was sharing with me was what he was what somebody had told him or if it's what he really remembered. But, you know, I was willing to get that if, if that was possible. And then um, he all, we also kind of talked about things we remembered from high school from the short time that we were together because we were in band together. And I liked him. I considered him a friend. He wasn't somebody I hung out with outside of school, but somebody that I like to be around whenever we were doing band competitions or something like that. And so we kind of talked about those things. And, you know, because he was still that person that I remember, not really a shooter. You know, to me, he was like two different people. And then I asked him something, some kind of message or something that he could give to kids because I told him, you know, I was speaking and then I was going to be writing a book at the time and I needed something from him because he was one of the few full shooters that was still alive. And so um, he shared with me that, you know, bullying was part of the problem. He was also kind of talking a lot about um, mental illness, but he said that bullying was part of the problem and that um, what he uh, suggested was that he felt like he had just held it in and didn't ask for help from anyone, and he said he would have asked for help. That's one of the things he would have changed, and maybe the outcome would have been different. Maybe his decision to do what he did to bring a gun to school would have been different. Um, and then at the end of the conversation, um, he told me that, um, he said, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I really feel like meeting with him was helpful but I don't think that there's ever such thing as closure because I think the shooting, especially because I have the chair to remind me, you know, all of that is something that I'll never forget. So, um, you know, but it brought me closer and, um, and, and making it easier to, to handle, but I've never, um, talked to, talk to him since then. I got what I needed as far as like a message from him to, to give to other people to help those that are thinking of doing something like this. And to, um, and just to, you know, for my own benefit of just kind of learning, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, Missy, is there anything else you would like to add that I might not have touched on before we start to wrap things up here? I guess maybe just that I've written a book about my experience and that if anyone's interested, um, you know, I really feel like there's a lot of lessons that I learned in it. and And the book is another part of me spreading my message. So if anybody's interested, they can go to MissyJenkinsSmith.com. And there is a way that they can um, actually uh, get the book and I can actually sign it to them and mail it to them. So, you know, it can be an actual signed copy. But it was another thing that I felt like God led me to do. I felt like God brought, because I had a co-writer, and I felt like God brought this man to me to help me because I was not a writer whatsoever. And he, he, he came up with the book with me, and it was almost like, you know, I was, speaking and it was just amazing and so it's just another tool that I felt like was that I could reach others and then also just if anyone's interested in having me come speak that's what I do it's what I love and it's and it's what God wants me to do and and I and my mission is is to you know help prevent these things from happening and and I'd love to to, to work out anything to, to, to come to school conferences churches I mean I do it all and, um, you know, and again, Missy Jenkins Smith is where they can contact me on that. So, but then I also want to thank everyone for the continued support that they've given me because without those supporters, I don't think I'd be where I am today or continue my mission of what God wants me to do. So, and thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Because that, that, that's so helpful to, to, you know, to even talk about it because that's, you know, that's what anybody who has a problem or has been through something tragic needs to do is talk and, and thank you for allowing me to do that. The 25th Hour Radio. Show.